And we're live and I have forgot to do the branding piece. So hang on, everybody, you need the countdown because it wouldn't be the same without the countdown, would it? Here we go. feel whole now <laughs> i have no idea what that means what does that mean it, it means i feel unknown? like i feel like i feel like the world is in order that we've had the, the countdown oh i see the countdown yes but it did give me a chance to remember to put the ticker tape because i never remember to do the ticker tape so i feel i feel all right it can't go too badly now that we've got the ticker tape all right so Hello, everybody out there. I say everybody because it looks like it's a relatively small group for the moment, but lots more people I'm sure will join as time ticks on. So why don't we just introduce ourselves like we usually do, Evgeny, and then people I'm sure will appear very shortly. So shall I start, seeing as I'm already Please. got my mouth going? That would right. be great. Okay. <laughs> right, so hello, everyone out there. I am Gigi uh, you probably know this because you found us through our YouTube channel. It's my face plastered all over the YouTube channel at this point. Hopefully, Yevgeny will be putting some content in shortly. So um, I am an ex-Amazon bar raiser here at Day One Careers. Day One Careers, we offer this incredible free YouTube channel. And we also do amazing and incredibly accessible courses to help you prepare for your Amazon interview. I got here by effectively whilst I was interviewing at Amazon, I noticed that people who had specialist interview coaching did much better. It was really clear to see who had specialist interview coaching and who didn't. So I started to do a YouTube channel. When I left Amazon, I set up my own little business and then I met Yevgeny and he might finish off the story for us. But together we are Day One Careers and we are doing everything that we can to help you nail your Amazon interview. I'll pass you to Yevgeny. Amazing. My name is Yevgeny, and um, I also was at Amazon, similarly to Gigi. So I spent uh, about three and a half years at Amazon as a marketing and a category leader, and also, as you would imagine, a hiring manager and an interviewer who interviewed for uh, his own, my own team, and also for partner teams. Um, similarly to Gigi, I did notice that candidates who... Uh, prepared really well, specifically with regards to Amazon's take on behavioral interviews, we're doing better. So what I started doing is I started uh, offering them a little bit of coaching um, during the phone screen one, um, rather than uh, discarding uh, uh, the particular profile and uh, not allowing the candidate to move on. And after offering them a little bit of coaching, I would pass them on to the second phone screen. And I could see that Offering candidates just a little bit of coaching um, already drives results. So similar to GJ, I've set up day one careers in 20, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, in 2020, um, first as a side business and then uh, when I met Gigi and we decided to merge our businesses together, um, I decided to go full time. And there you go. So um, that's us. Um, you get us for an hour and we'll answer all of your questions related to Amazon's behavioral interviewing. Cool. Before we start, though, Evgeny, what, what's going on in the background there? Uh, what, something's changed. You don't usually have that kind of texture behind you. Are you in a cupboard? I'm in a cupboard. I'm in a cupboard, and I, I haven't started sweating, um, but um, uh, everywhere in this co-work, there is air conditioning except for this cupboard. Oh, you're um, in a co-work. It's one of those, you know, you know, at Amazon, we had one of those, like, phone booths Yeah. Uh, where you do get pretty sweaty in about 20 minutes, so watch mm -hmm. me. And, nice. And, uh, and I don't have our branded T-shirt either because I'm visiting someone in Bristol, so oh, I'm, I I'm on tour. I forgot. Yevgeny on tour. <laughs> I hope exactly. what goes on tour stays on tour, although I think you've got one of your children with you, don't you? So not going to be that much excitement. No. <laughs> this, is, this is the exciting point. Let's this do is it. the exciting <laughs> bit. Fair enough. OK, so welcome, welcome, everyone. We've got a nice solid size audience now. So just to let you know how this is going to work, if you haven't been here before, all you need to do super easy is to drop us your question in the little comments box on the 
what I think is the right hand side of your page. It's certainly the right hand side of my page. We will do everything we can to try and answer your question. Just a couple of caveats. The first is, please don't ask us very specific technical questions about a technical part of your interview. So we are experts in the behavioral and the behavioral interview piece is completely universal. All job families, all levels, all countries of the world. But when we get into specific job family and the technical nature, there are tens of thousands of job families in Amazon and no one, two, three, four group of people could possibly get to that level of detail for those. So I'm afraid we're gonna have to pass on those technical questions. The second one is, please don't ask us just kind of generically, hey, Gigi, Evgeny, I've got a program manager interview tomorrow. Any tips? Because all we're going to say to you is, yeah, thousands of them, hundreds of hours. Go watch the YouTube channel. So generic questions, I'm sorry, we're going to skip. Very specific technical questions, I'm sorry, we're also going to skip. But we'll try and let you know if we're not going to be able to answer your question. Please, if you possibly can, try and fit your question into one single comment. I do know there's a character limit, but it's super hard to navigate if you cut it, drop it across three or four and somebody else gets in between you, it blows our mind. So if you can just constrain it to one single text box, that would be super useful for us. I think that's it. So why don't we get going? So the way Evgeny and I do this is we pick one each and then you know, sometimes we just kind of like riff off each other. So we will be doing that. Yevgeny, do you want to just pick one and I'll just let everyone know about the amazing yeah. offer at the end. So I'll give you a second to do that. So please, please stay until the end. We have an amazing offer for you, which is a free course. So please stay until the end. And then we also have some additional exciting news that we don't usually have on a Monday to share with you today as well. So stay until the end or you will miss out. Right. Are you good to go? Have you got one? I'm good to go. <clears throat> I've got one. And um, here it is. So this is a general question about <clears throat> uh, prep. Uh, thanks for hosting. I have a loop um, interview scheduled in a couple of weeks for an F SFA road. Most of the advice you see is geared towards tech roles. Any advice for non-tech roles? So um, I think we, we get this uh, quite a lot from candidates who are trying to understand Kind of what is relevant to the which part of their assessment. So I can reassure you that everything that you will find within day one careers is geared um, fairly and squarely towards um, the non-technical uh, prep. And what we call non-technical, um, it basically means behavioral in an Amazon world. Um, in the Amazon world, there's behavioral assessment, there's functional assessment, and then there's technical assessment. So everything that you're going to have here, uh, we won't be able to help you crack your finance test, but we will help you crack your behavioral interview. So you've come to the right place. Anything to add? No, other than I was desperately trying to work out SFA, SFA, SFA. Senior finance, finance analyst. analyst. Got it now. <laughs> Got it now. Cool. So I'm very quickly just going to pull Mike up from the audience. Mike from the UK, up the Brits. You got an offer for business development. You are very, very welcome. Congratulations. Uh, we're absolutely delighted for you and we wish you a very happy Amazon career. Okay, so now I'm going to, I won't cheat and pass back to Evgeny because that would be really, really cruel. Um, so I'm going to jump to this one, to Edgar. So you are very welcome for our support. They've scheduled two interviews. The first one, I think there's a little typo there, is 45 minutes. What should you expect from this first interview? Okay, so I do have a video, we do have a video about what to expect for the first interview on the YouTube channel. So you can go and check that out. But to cut it short, um, it depends actually on whether you are applying for a technical role or a non-technical role. If you're applying for a technical role, odds are the first interview is very much gonna be about testing your technical skill set and making sure you actually have the skills and the capability to do the role. On top of that, they may also do that little bit of the exploration of your resume. On top of that, they may also ask you those questions, which I loathe, but hey ho, the introductory questions, why Amazon, tell me about yourself. And they may even throw in a behavioral question on top of that. It could be a combination of any of those things. If you are applying for a non-tech role, 
pretty much the same goes other than the technical element where they may not be probing you. But at the same time, pretty much in almost any role, there are some specific technical skill sets. It might not be coding or solutions architecture, but if you're applying for an email role, someone's still going to want some confidence that you understand about email, CRM tools, blah, blah, blah. So in truth, Edgar, you kind of have to be prepared for anything because those early round ones and round twos, if you have one, aren't as prescriptive as things get once you get to loop. So prepare yourself for anything. Okay, that's that one. Anything to add, Yevgeny? Not at all. Very extensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got a question here uh, from Christina. Um, who is um, who's watched a lot of our LP deep dives. And her question is, will interviewers give you a strike if you, you refer to a note to collect thoughts? So my interpretation of this, Christina, <clears throat> is that you, what you're trying to do is during an interview, uh, you've got some notes um, in front of you. Maybe they are electronic. Maybe you've printed them off. And they have some bullet points uh, from your professional situations that you were going to share during the interview. And the question is, are you going to get a strike um, if you refer to those? So um, our general guidance is that um, you should feel free to refer to your notes um, as long as you do not read from a script. I have personally seen specific guidance from recruiters uh, to candidates that some candidates forwarded to me where Recruiters are expressly confirming that, you know, um, your work is your work experience. However, whatever helps you recall it better, as long as you don't read from a script, because otherwise it's not a real conversation. So please feel free also to prepare yourself to veer off your prepared script in case your interviewer decides to get conversational and doesn't allow you to tell the whole story. Uh, but generally speaking, um, it's not a memory test. Um, uh, so your work notes is something that you should have in front of you. They are your friend. Do refer to them. But just don't read from a script. Anything to add? No, I'm just glad you kept talking whilst I sneezed. Okay, my turn then. Okay, so we're going to go up here to... Oh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm going for Jairo. I apologize if that's incorrect. Um, in one of our videos, we mentioned not repeating examples. What if the example can be broken down and applied to two or three leadership principles? Is it a bad idea to use it? Okay, so we get this question quite a lot. So we'll give you the answer that we often give, which is um, there is a split view inside Amazon as to how people feel about repeating examples, uh, both repetition within a loop or even repetition between different rounds. So we offer guidance that is on the conservative side, which is to say that if you can avoid repeating, please do. If you can't avoid repeating because you simply don't have enough examples, you can use the same example, but fundamentally aim to reshape it. So if you have an example that you want to use for customer obsession, then focus all about the customer obsession, you know, how you're gathering feedback, how you're making sure you understand the customer, blah, 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 blah. And then if you want to use it again, you want to use it for deliver results, then make sure you focus on the barriers that you broke down or the prioritization decisions that you made or how you managed to fit something in within a, a strict time zone, whatever. Um, but make sure that you really focus on the different elements of those leadership principles for the second time that you tell the story. However, there are also scenarios, and i kind of inferring this from when you talk about example being broken down, there are examples where people work on really long projects, like these projects last for six months, a year, whatever it is. And they're, they're worried that they can't use that kind of full year's worth of work more than once. So what we suggest in that space is you can at that point chunk your example down into different parts. You can either do that chronologically if the project had a number of phases or you can do it maybe on a swim lane basis, i.e. if a project has a number of different kind of key elements to it that you had to work on concurrently. You can break it down that way, kind of chronologically or across the swim lanes and use those as separate examples, even though in your mind it's the same kind of project overall, you can still break it down into those individual kind of mini projects, if you like, and repeat the example that way. That's, a, I guess, a safer option 
than the first one that we described, but obviously not an option open to everyone because not, you know, not everyone has projects that are massive and last a year, six months or so. That's it. Did I miss anything, Yevgeny? Nope. Everything extremely extensive. Um, so I'm just going to jump a little bit forward to a question about compensation, which you know I love questions about compensation. <clears throat> so, hey, Gigi, I got a low ball offer. Uh, for a non-tech L6 role, the hiring manager has applied for an exception and has taken more than two weeks. I was told that they're waiting for some signatures. Is it normal to take this long? So um, how long this process will take entirely depends on many different factors, which is what is the role, what is the range, what was the original offer, what is the offer that the hiring manager is trying to push through, how, how far is it from what they offered? And also, it depends on the economic climate and the general climate within the organization, Amazon, on how, um, how much appetite they have to, um, to go over and above the initial offers and involve compensation and benefits team and a whole bunch of stakeholders to approve your offer. So all I would say is um, the signs are great because your hiring manager actually liked your performance and you as a candidate enough to take it up with the camp compensation and benefits team. However, from what we can tell across the entire big tech, um, things are a little bit shaky when it comes to um, uh, the general hiring and expenditure and headcount. So um, if I were you, I would give them uh, a few more days and then start following or following up. But generally speaking, Given everything that's happening out there in the economy, it doesn't concern me. Um, I was in exactly the same position, by the way, with uh, with Apple uh, shortly after COVID hit. Um, they've battened down the hatches on, on uh, most recruitment, and it took me about three weeks to get everything pulled through. So it's not just Amazon. You'll you'll see this happening in many different companies. So I, so far, everything's okay. But in a, in a few days, feel free to follow up. Anything to add, Gigi? Okay, so Marge, I'm going with, you have your final loop and you need to complete an assignment for a solutions architect role. Do I think it's a good idea to ask questions to HR? I think, I mean, in order to understand the customer needs. So I don't quite understand the in order to understand the customer needs bit. I don't know if you are thinking about Amazon being the customer here, but that's kind of by the by. Um, I think the broader point is, if you have a question, ask your recruiter. I, you could, there's never a good reason not to ask the recruiter for some clarifying information. They might say to you, I'm sorry, I can't answer that for you. Well, no harm, no foul. No one's ever going to put a black mark against your name for asking questions to make sure that you understand the task at hand. So yes, go back and ask your recruiter any questions that you have about that particular assignment. Good luck. Excellent. Here's an interesting one. Are the leadership principles still useful for a non-leadership role? So I think um, when when I get this question, uh, it usually sounds like um, there's a bit of confusion with regards to what leadership principles actually are at Amazon. So all um, Fortune 500 organizations, big multinational organizations, they will have what they're going to call core competencies. So in the world of uh, talent management, that's actually what, what, what these are. Core competencies are uh, effectively behaviors that the leadership of the company believes um, uh, will enable employees to be successful in their roles. That's basically what it is. At Amazon, they're called leadership principles. The reason why they're called leadership principles is because I, um, the senior leadership at Amazon believes that everyone's a leader. And uh, they believe that these core competencies are signs of great leaders. So the answer to your question is, are the leadership principles still useful for um, a non-leadership role? At Amazon, they're essential. So uh, do study them well, and I hope your interviews go well. Anything to add, Gigi? OK, I'm going to pick this one here for cyber t so you're going through first round interview for a grad software engineering role you don't have work experience how do you prepare for leadership principles in this case well uh, to unable to avoid sounding like a broken record we do actually have a video about this on our youtube channel for graduates so go check out the youtube channel there's a video there that says it's for grads to summarize 
obviously Amazon knows that you don't have the work experience. So they're not expecting you to come with examples of work experience. Although if, obviously if you've done any internships or anything like that, that's super useful data to bring to the party. If you're talking about anything else, then Amazon would be perfectly comfortable with you using scenarios from volunteering work that you've done or any kind of uh, roles that you've played in terms of running kind of societies or events or anything like that when you are at school, university, college, whatever they call it, where you're from. And then, of course, any type of kind of projects or kind of programs of work that you had to do as part of your course can also be used. Your challenge is to bridge the concept words between kind of the business context and the student context. So as an example, when Amazon maybe asks you a customer obsession question, when they're talking about customer, maybe you could think about people who were members of uh, a society that you were on the um, committee for, or if you were running an event, people that bought tickets for that event. If they're asking you questions on and trust and about getting the cooperation of a peer, you could probably think about some kind of a group project that you did whilst you were at school, college, university, and the colleagues or peers that we're referring to, are there other people that were part of that project? So you just really need to look at the language of the leadership principles and think about how that might convert to the context of where you're coming from, be it um, internships, volunteering, school, college, university and do go check out the video. That's it, Evgeny, you good? Great, yeah, I'm good, great response. I, I, I really do wish <clears throat> current students w watch this video because your extracurricular activities are so useful and mm -hmm. um, do get involved to minimize regrets down the line. Um, right, um, so here's a question. So um, uh, Jorge here will have the loop interview for the Network Development Engineer 2. And as far as he knows, the bar raiser is not related to the team. So how do you handle if you need to explain deep technical details? <clears throat> so Jorge, um, from what I can understand, um, the fact that the bar raiser is not related to the team, that's actually to be expected. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, bar raisers are meant to be a fresh pair of eyes. Now, <clears throat> Your question is about how do you explain um, deep technical details. So I'm a little bit concerned that you are actually expecting or planning to be sharing deep technical uh, details in your, well, any interview, whether it's with a bar raiser or not with a bar raiser. The reason why I'm concerned about it, Jorge, is because um, the uh, behavioral part of your assessment, right, um, it actually... Uh, being very technical and going in great depth about the specific technical concepts will not score you any points. Um, uh, in, in fact, the opposite is true. Uh, being able <clears throat> to tell a story in simple and plain English and being able <clears throat> for an additional point to distill uh, complex and deep technical concepts in something simple, something that a reasonably non-technical person can understand, is actually a sign of someone who can distill complexity into simplicity. And Amazon really, really likes that. So I unfortunately will have to bat it back to you and challenge you to, uh, in fact, when you prepare your stories, to try and simplify deep technical concepts into something that even a non-technical person can understand. And interview in this way, even with folks that have technical titles. Trust me, if they want to probe you on your knowledge of a deep technical concept, they will probe you. They're going to go that way. They're not going to leave it on the table. But your main focus is a behavioral interview. And during the behavioral interview, uh, it's not a test of your technical prowess. Uh, what do you think, Gigi? Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you and I do mock interviews with people who are in technical areas that are just a million miles away from any of our background, hardware engineers, network engineers, security, um, cybersecurity, solutions construction, architects, construction, construction managers. Oh, yes, exciting. Um, 
I'm waiting to get a horticultural person. I can't wait to <laughs> do a mock it's interview coming. with someone who runs the horticultural section. Um, so you you need to be able to, to Yevgeny's point, explain your narrative to anybody who you know has no concept whatsoever of where you're from, because it's to Yevgeny's point about how you behaved. Um, okay, I'm going to do this one really quickly, and then um, Yevgeny's going to be cross with me, because this one's going to be a yes. <laughs> Is it really bar raiser and hiring manager who have the last decision to hire or not? Yes. Your turn, Yevgeny. Oh, amazing. <laughs> well, here we go. I, so I, I, I'm just picking <clears throat> a random question. I don't have a prepared answer. So here you go. Hi, Gigi and Yevgeny. <clears throat> Do some of the LPs repeat on the loop? Asking because many people are very focused on getting the LPs from the job specs. Um, one knows which uh, ma uh, matter most likely. Here there is a discount. <laughs> There's a lot of questions in there. <laughs> so there you go. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna pull a Gigi here. So um, right. do some of the LPs uh, repeat on the loop? They shouldn't. I'm not gonna say that some random interviewer will not sort of, you know, uh, for some reason ask you uh, an LP question that they shouldn't. But basically, they should not repeat the the. Uh, the folks who are interviewing you, they're going to be assigned what LPs they're interviewing you on. And um, unless they really, really, really want to, they're not going to deviate from that plan. So I personally have never seen this happen. Um, but the only reason why I'm saying this, you know, I can't give you 100% guarantee is because, you know, um, anything that contravene, that does not contravene the laws of physics can, in theory, happen. Um, but don't, don't worry about it. So uh, you're existential asking... Existential comment uh yes yes come to day one careers for existential comments but uh asking because many people are focused on getting the lps right so the reason why people are focused on getting the lps and squeezing them out from job descriptions is because there are 16 lps but they won't be interviewing you in the whole 16. so actually um scanning your job description for keywords of lps it's a useful um technique to just uh, chop down the amount of prep that you need to do and <clears throat> we've got a great video in our YouTube channel uh, that explains the process. Uh, you can do it yourself. Um, you can also book the service with us if you want. But generally speaking, it's a highly advisable thing to do. And you should chop everything down to, uh, well, it depends on how many interviews you have. But for example, if you've got five interviewers and it's a non-tech role, it's usually two LPs per interview. So... Um, so that comes it comes down to 10. So, you know, from 16, you come down to 10. Trust me, that is almost, you know, 50% less prep. And if you're also quite clever with your stories and you can, can you re reuse them in a clever way, that chops it down even further. So actually, it's a great strategy. Please do use it, but use it really well. Um, and yes, there will be a discount, but um, uh, wait for it. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome okay um okay cool i'll pick this one edgar again delivery station manager i love the way you've given me your job id <laughs> what am i gonna do with that <laughs> should you expect to be interviewed from people who are working on that specific site or can it be any one of amazon recruiters all right so amazon recruiters don't interview Okay, Amazon recruiters will do an origin, an early kind of screening just to make sure that, you know, it's not a crazy idea to put you forward for this role. But that's it. Then they're out of the game because they have a vested interest in candidates getting hired and them being involved in the interview process would effectively be a bias, them marking their own homework. So, but I don't think you meant Amazon recruiters, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that. So, should you expect to be interviewed people who are on that specific site or could it be anyone from Amazon? I'm going to change that final word. Um, yes, you probably should expect to be interviewed from people who are on your actual site that you're applying for. If there is, in fact, a specific site that is noted, quite often there aren't and you're just applying for a particular level role and then the actual location that they send you to is kind of a conversation that happens afterwards once you've got an offer. But assuming there is a specific site associated with this job ID, then yes, I would expect you to be interviewed by at least one person from that site. But that said, there is no constraint in the kind of policy that requires everybody that interviews you to be from that site. So you could also expect that you will be interviewed by people who are in operations, who run operations in different sites. You could even expect to be interviewed by someone who runs an operation in a different country. 
to the one that you're going to be operating out of. That certainly happens. And then, of course, expect your bar raiser. Your bar raiser may well be from ops. They may not be from ops. They just not need to not be in the team that you are interviewing for. I hope that helps. Over to you, Yovgiri. Amazing. Um, well, I've noticed that it is uh, half an hour. And uh, <sighs> do we need to do what, what we normally do? We do. I had lost track of time. Shall I do the honors or would you like to? Uh, yes, please. Because otherwise, last time I picked the wrong one. Okay. Right. So, everybody, Yevgeny and I have a favor to ask you. As you well know, we put a huge amount of effort into this channel for you. And we do it with love, of course. But in return, we would like some love too. So, what we need from you is anytime you watch one of our videos, Anytime you watch a live like this, we really need you to give it a thumbs up or to put, and really, to put a comment in. And even subscribe if you're not a subscriber, but if you're here, I'm assuming you are. The reason is this is considered to be positive engagement signals by the YouTube algorithm. That tells the algorithm that our content is good and that they are targeting the right type of person. That then drives the algorithm to lift the priority of our content higher up and in front of some of the really long tenured, really bad content that has been on YouTube about Amazon interviewing for years and is complete nonsense, but it has priority because it has tenure. So we need you to do that for us. So in the next couple of seconds, we're just gonna ask you to give this particular stream a little bit of a like, and then we can move on with the rest of the session. So we, um, I say we, I created a little video just to entertain you for these few seconds. So whilst you're giving it a thumbs up, here goes. Oh, the top note at the end. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm still very proud of that. Just so that everybody knows, I take full responsibility for that video. Yevgeny had nothing to do with it whatsoever other than having his head slammed in it, whether he liked it or not. So I take full responsibility. Absolutely love the video. But shall we Let's keep go. cracking? So yeah. here's a very interesting question. Not so much about interviewing, but probably for someone considering Amazon as a place to work. And... So the question is, I heard that the 6% pip culture at Amazon, um, does this create a culture that everyone is competing with each other to, ra to raise the bar and everyone is concerned about their performance? And then there's a sub question there. Is information sharing <coughs> and team collaboration impacted by this pip culture? So the first thing I'll, I'll address is, is the, you know, the, the pip culture um, on its own. For those of you who don't know, um, in you know, if you spend too much time on teamblind.com, you'll probably come across this uh, definition, PIP culture. So PIP start, uh, stands for Performance Improvement Plan, and, the, and PIP culture refers to this assumption or a belief that um, Amazon uh, oftentimes either hires to fire for some reason or um, makes it incredibly difficult for people to perform well in their jobs and just cannot wait to fire you as soon as they as soon as they've hired you. Um, so um, my recommendation would be uh, don't spend uh, a lot of time on Team Blind. Uh, so Amazon is a huge organization, mass, massive organization. And um, anything you say about a massive collection of people, whether it's an organization or a country, anything you say about them will probably be true somewhere, in some place, right? I'm not going to tell you that they're not going to be. <laughs> Sorry, um, <clears throat> lots of hiccups today, but I'll still keep chatting. Um, so... Um, I can't guarantee you that there won't be a team that will feel like this, right? With this much intensity and toxic culture. Um, but it's not just Amazon, right? Any, any, any company that you work in, you may be unlucky and just come across a team like that. So hip culture has not been my experience at Amazon and has not been the experience of most, most of my friends and colleagues at Amazon. So um, I disagree that Amazon... Um, has a PIP culture. The 6% is um, an internal HR rate that um, motivates Amazon to keep on stack ranking, 
stack ranking is uh, not an idea that Amazon actually invented. It was invented at General Electric by Jack Welch. So this has absolutely, absolutely nothing exclusive or unique to Amazon. In fact, every single company that I've worked in, Procter & Gamble, Diageo, Yum Brands, um, um, uh, were uh, practicing stack ranking. Does this create um, uh, is information sharing and team collaboration impacted by this FIP culture. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you that from my experience working in devices, the opposite is true. Um, uh, performance issues were uh, happening with folks who were uh, purposefully trying to hoard information and not share it. So there you go. Make uh, make as uh, with it as you as you wish. I believe Amazon has a great culture. Um, it is a massive organization. It works uh, and, and it grows hard. So you may be lucky or unlucky, but I would imagine that most of the time you will be lucky. Anything you would add, Gigi? Based no, on your experience? that's absolutely it. And I think your point about um, does it drive hoarding and collaboration uh, negatively? Absolutely the opposite, because if you do hoard and you don't collaborate, then you can almost be guaranteed to find yourself on PIP. So, all right. So I just want to quickly pull this one up. So we've got HN and you finished your second work week at Amazon. Oh, and you've got your L6. You are so welcome. And I, the last bit of your sentence actually makes me feel a bit teary. Sorry, I'm a kind of emotional person anyway. Um, can't imagine what it means for me and your family. I can because I've been there, right? And that's part of why, um, why we feel good about what we do because we won't tell you anything that we don't know is absolutely 100% fact. If we don't know it, we will be honest with you and tell you we don't know it. So we absolutely know we've been there. It changed our lives and our family's lives as well. And it is uh, a privilege and a pleasure to be able to help other people do the same. This is the, my favorite job. I've never loved a job as much as I love this for this exact reason. So bless your heart for coming on and sharing that with us. We are, well, I can speak for Evgeny here, but I am deeply grateful for people who take the time to give us that feedback. It, it chokes me up. All right. So I will now actually answer a question, Evgeny. I won't cheat again. I promise you. Um, so Jags, you've got a virtual interview next week. One of the interviewers from the virtual panel was the same who took your phone interview. How do you look at that as advantage or disadvantage? Neither because it's completely normal. So everybody should get this experience. And the reason why everybody should get this experience is it is um, what I call a high bar check. So Amazon is testing that you can keep impressing somebody repeatedly. So they met you the first time, you gave them one set of answers and they were impressed by that. If you can meet them again a second time and they can continue to be impressed and you can give them new and engaging stories, then that's extra validation that you're not a one trick pony as it were, and you didn't just get lucky on your first interview, you're able to sustain, maintain and even better lift up in terms of your performance. So neither advantage or disadvantage. Anything I missed, Yevgeny? No, oh, I you're think you're choking. It's... You're right. No, 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 I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm muting myself when I uh, when I'm choking, so I'm trying not to do that. Uh, cool. So we've got a question here. It's interesting. Uh, how mu how much data is enough uh, in an answer? So uh, Ankur here feels that his answers go overboard to give data points. Each answer goes into at least nine to ten minutes. Um, first of all, uh, if your answer is nine to ten minutes and you're interviewing for an L6 role, I'm actually not that concerned. In fact, I'm actually not. I, I would be more concerned if your answer was two minutes. Then that would make me very concerned. If you're telling me your answer is nine to ten minutes, generally speaking, uh, I'm not concerned. Now, how much data is enough? Um, it is a judgment call, right? So you need to. Um, you need to figure out this by yourself. I can tell. I can give you my own personal guardrail on how I would approach this. So um, Amazon, it would be really good in an interview, first of all, to stick to facts, right? Because facts are data. Wherever you, whichever section in your star response you're narrating, facts is data. So that is one big first tick, right? And then the second thing is um, pay attention to actions, right? In actions, um, they have to be all start with I, and they all have to relate to something that you personally did. Each time you make a statement like that, I, I did this, I did that, I did that, it's a fact, equals data, right? And then the last one is goals and results, right? 
what did you want to accomplish, which in the STAR methodology is your, is your task and your results. Um, obviously, in an ideal world, and this is what we recommend, you need to offer uh, some KPIs, something numeric, something that could be objectively measured, whether you have achieved it or not, whether you you were successful or not in both places, in your task and in your results. Um, how much data is required? <clears throat> I'm going to go as far as to say that less is more here. So, for example, in the actual, even the actual scenario, you were measuring five KPIs. If I were you, I would say I was measuring this on five KPIs, but actually the most important ones for me that would tell me if I got there is one, two, three. Stick it in the task, stick it in the results, and that's it. If you've got more KPIs, that's great. Put them in your work notes, keep them in the back of your sleeve. And if the interviewer decides to um, uh, follow up and get some more details, you're going to have something there. So, in fact, I'm going to say apply the 80 20 rule. Share the least amount of the most impactful data, um, and you'll be fine. Gigi, uh, what do you think? You're on mute. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, nothing to add. Perfect, as always, Evgeny. Um, okay, I'm going to just do this one. Um, so I know we kind of covered this earlier, but there's a bit of a nuance that I just want to add into my response here, and then maybe Evgeny will have something to add. So is the bar raiser input a make or break decision, or is it a conjunction of all the interviewers put together? All right, I'm going to break this down. Is the bar raiser's input a make or break decision? No, because the bar raiser puts their inputs into their assessment of you when they met you, and then everyone else puts in their inputs. So the bar raiser's inputs do not have a greater weighted contribution than anybody else's inputs. But what then happens is the bar raiser reads everybody else's inputs. And they reflect on all of that data, their inputs and everybody else's inputs. And then they'll talk in debrief to all of the other interviewers and they will add additional inputs. And at the end of that conversation, everyone will take a view, interviewers, hiring managers and bar raisers. And in an ideal word as a bar raiser, you try to get to 100% alignment. It's pretty rare, actually. Most debriefs do not end up with everybody agreeing but you try and get there if you can but ultimately the hiring manager and the bar raiser are the ones that need to get aligned on the outside cases they can't and if a hiring manager wants to hire you but given all of the inputs that the bar raiser has read and listened to in the course of the debrief does not convince them that you are a bar raising candidate with long term career growth potential at Amazon, you will not get hired. Equally, if the bar raiser thinks you'd be great and they want to hire you, but the hiring manager doesn't want to hire you, you're still not going to get hired because no bar raiser is going to force a hiring manager to take on somebody that they don't want. That will only end badly for everybody involved. So, I may have been kind of over analyzing the language that you used in your particular question, but I just want to be very, very clear. Everybody's input has equal value. The ultimate decision maker, arbitrator of whether you are or are not bar raising is the bar raiser. But they will be of everybody. They should be the most open minded to reading other people's inputs and being able to set aside or at least um, add to their observations than anybody else because they're experts, that's their job, that's what they've been trained for. It's not their job, you don't get paid to be a bar raiser, by the way, everybody, it's not like a separate job in Amazon, it's just something you do for the love of it, for no extra pay, just making that point. Um, anything to add, Evgeny, is that clear? The only thing I'd add is to, sum, uh, I'll summarize, work the whole panel. Don't just work the bar raiser. That's the only uh, viable strategy. Make sure you have a consistent 
I was, gonna, I was gonna say I can edit those things out so hiccup away but actually I don't put this into um, Premiere Pro so no I can't edit out so sorry you can't no that's okay that's okay so just make sure you have a consistent uh, performance during the interview do not focus just on um, behavior around oh sorry by raising by raising around there are hiring, hiring hands around um, cool uh, so we've got here uh, <clears throat> a uh, question from Edgar uh, on behavioral questions scenarios uh, could scenarios be repeated but focused on different principles? I understand that it is better to have a lot of scenarios, but is it bad to repeat uh, the same situation with a different approach? Um, well, I think, look, you've you've kind of nailed it on the head. Uh, we always recommend to make sure that um, you um, take every opportunity to rustle through your career career history and your CV and your memory in terms of your situations um, to generate content that varies. So you've got um, uh, two stories per, per leadership principle, and um, the more differentiated they are, the better. Um, does that mean that if you can't generate that, uh, that much content and you have to um, use uh, the same situation for uh, different LPs, is, is that a viable strategy? Yes, of course it is. It is a viable strategy. Is it as good as having um, a one per, um, uh, two per LP and these are different? No, it isn't, but it is it is a viable strategy and, you know, we've had candidates to go offer, so use that strategy. Uh, just make sure, as you stated in your question, um, uh, uh, so you can uh, share the same professional context uh, between these two so stories. But as soon as that is done, from the problem statement on, make sure you focus on an entire, entirely different a set of behaviors so that, um, you know, when someone asks you an invent and simplify question, um, you are answering an invent and simplify question and not a customer obsession question where you came up with the story initially. Um, would you agree, Gigi? Yeah, I would. Oh, I feel so awful. <laughs> Everybody, thank you, Evgeny, for bearing, keeping on pushing through. It's been You're happening such a... for seven, seven, You're... seven hours today. You're such a trooper. Oh. Okay, so let me pick another one. Um, is it likely to get the same leadership principle in the phone interview and loop? Um, from a statistical point of view, I don't have the data to tell you this. But what I will say is if your hiring manager is playing it smart and thinking strategically about how they manage the kind of the top end of the funnel and the bottom end of the funnel, then the answer should be yes. Because what the smart hiring manager is doing is front loading the most important leadership principles for them, because uh, those are the ones they really need you to be amazing at. And anybody that is not amazing at those leadership principles, they can get rid of them early on in the process and not waste too much time pulling them down into loop only to discover that they can't raise the bar on the things that are most important for them. So if you're a smart hiring manager, you front load your most important leadership principles so that you can filter out people who are not going to be able to raise the bar on those leadership principles. And then you test them again at loop because what you then do is revalidate that this person is not a one trick pony. I think I used that language earlier. You want people that consistently perform well in those leadership principles. And if you don't ask those leadership principles again, you risk the fact that this person only ever did one amazing dive deep thing in their entire career. They told you about it in phone screen one, but you didn't know that it was a one off. So what you want to do is make sure that you retest for those most important leadership principles so you get validation that this person consistently and repeatedly performs well at Dive Deep. So again, no statistical data on probability, but if somebody's smart as a hiring manager and thinking strategically, they most certainly should be repeating LPs between top of the funnel and loop. That's Excellent. it. Sorry, there's some funny light stuff going on here. The sun is setting kind of right in front of me and I've got these slatted curtains. So I, I look like a zebra or something strange going on here. It's like a, it's like a scene from a 1980s horror movie, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, they love those dramatic sort of lights. Um, very charming. Uh, right. So um, here's a question from, um, um, I think it's Alex, because I think E is next close to the R, so I'm going to say, I'm going to assume it's Alex, Alex Kane. So Alex, um, the question is, um, can you share what would be the one reason that someone uh, gets a rejection after applying for a job? Um, you never got to the, to the second phase after submitting uh, submitting jobs, probably applications, even uh, with uh, having qualified uh, from the job description. <clears throat> well, Alex, um, 
uh, to be honest, if everyone who qualified uh, based on uh, their CV matching the job description alone uh, were was to get the job, then the competition uh, for the jobs would probably be who's going to be the first one to submit the application. And if you can click the buttons the quickest, then you get the job. Um, so um, it is what Amazon calls a high judgment process, which means that um, uh, Amazon understands that in order for someone to um, make a great hire, uh, multiple individuals need to not only uh, be happy with their qualifications and the technical chops and um, <clears throat> other um, other elements of the resume, but also to get you to substantiate your whatever whatever you're claiming on your resume with real projects, real accomplishments, and hopefully with plenty of data that brings it to life um, in subsequent uh, interviews. Right. Um, so. Um, is there one reason why you can get a rejection? Um, no. I mean, um, I would say that uh, it sounds like you never got to uh, the phone screen too or to the loop. So depending on the role that you interviewed for, depending on what was the content of your first uh, stage, your, um, your phone screen, it could be uh, you either did not raise the bar um, on um, a particular leadership principle or you didn't raise the bar at a particular level. Maybe you did raise the bar at, let's say, L4, but the job was uh, scoped at an L5, and they absolutely feel like they need an L5 person when it comes to their professional uh, experience and maturity, and uh, you just didn't quite make it there. Or or um, they um, also uh, tried to give you some functional competency questions, and they didn't believe that functionally, despite what you've claimed in your resume, uh, that it worked out. So um, uh, all I can say is keep applying. Make sure you continue applying to those jobs that do match your professional experience. It sounds like that's what you're doing. And um, <clears throat> one of them um, surely will, will work out for you. And then hopefully you will get in. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything to add, Gigi? Uh, only a slight reinterpretation of the question. Um, wasn't quite sure whether Alex... Um, Alexander, I assume it must be, um, oh, there you go, uh, was talking about getting past actually the application stage. I am I think maybe he means application stage as first stage and then second phase being interview. Uh, you've given, you already you touched on it already, but um, the biggest reason why I and my colleagues and the people that work for me rejected resumes was lack of specifics around projects and impact. So not dissimilar from what the um, answer is when it comes to your actual interview itself, but your resume has to show specific projects that you've done and the impact slash contribution that you made to your business as a result of those projects. So I tend to think about resumes in the star format situation. Who are you working for? What's your role? Broadly, then task becomes your responsibilities actions is the projects that you do the things that you've actually acted upon and delivered and then results are obviously the actual kind of metrics that you deliver that's how i think about resumes and in my experience a large number of people's resumes focus the majority on the task piece these are my responsibilities and do not put enough focus on the action slash result section and therefore amazon's like well i got no sense of what contribution you've made to your business and therefore meh don't want to talk to you. And that's, I guess, my feedback on the biggest reason why people don't get past the resume stage. May not have been your question, but thought I'd chat, take it on that angle as well. Um, okay, I will quickly pick this one because I want to congratulate Clive Nethersoul. That's a great surname, Clive. I always wonder, sometimes I look at people's surnames and I think, where would that have come from? You know, so that's a cool surname. Uh, you are more than welcome. Congratulations. I hope you had an amazing day one. And I'm sure we wish you many, many more happy and enjoyable day ones from here onward. I won't cheat. I promise Evgeny, I'm going to pick another one. So um, I swear I, I've got a, a fake recollection of Clive Nethersoul being a, cele a celebrity um, a TV personality. And really? if you're not, then at any point in time, if you consider being one, be <laughs> just take over the domain name. I bet you could buy the domain name and you'll already have a ton of traffic. 
<laughs> All right. So, so, so I just said pick another one. So here we go and go for this one. So you followed our video and advice and you emailed the recruiter question about the written assignment before submitting and the role's job level wasn't clear. Weird not to hear back in a few days. It's not really weird if I'm honest with you, Christina. You know, these recruiters, I don't think most applicants, candidates realize how many people or at least how many requisitions recruiters are working on at any point in time. So obviously we know lots of Amazon recruiters and certainly one recruiter that I know who works in the tech space had 30 recs, 30 recs on the go at a single point in time. Now, if you imagine that in any point in time of a process, there's probably five people, let's say live in a single rec, either at loop, round two, round one. Okay, that's a lot of people that this one recruiter is trying to communicate with. So it's not weird to not hear back within a few days. Um, I would suggest following up with your recruiter to just kind of get your email to the top of their inbox. Yevgeny has a lovely little trick that, he, that everybody used at Amazon, I think he still likes, which is you um, simply re-email them and say, just bringing this to the top of your inbox, <laughs> which is a very polite way of saying, don't ignore me. Um, but yeah, do that. Um, give them a couple of days, maybe. But yeah, it's not weird. It's got nothing to do with you, Christina. It's just a function of the fact that these recruiters do actually have an enormous workload and will do their best to try and keep up with it. And they get lots of questions, as you can imagine. Is that fair, Yevgeny? That is, <clears throat> that is very, very fair. Should we do one more question and then talk about the surprise that we've got? For oh, everyone? yes. I didn't realize the time. I've lost track of time. Go on. You pick the last one. Okay, cool. So, uh, and uh, uh, Walid, uh, thank you so much for your uh, recommendation on how to get rid of hiccups. Uh, holding my breath <laughs> is exactly what I've been doing for the last eight hours, and it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> does not work so if you've got any other thoughts please do post it in the chat or even i have one section. i have yes, one that me. always works for my children get a brown paper bag and breathe in and out like kind of when you're trying to stop yourself hyperventilating mm -hmm. breathe in and out of a brown paper bag that helps or well, it has helped my kids anyway amazing right uh, here's the question <clears throat> if a sourcing recruiter reached out to me for one position and I have also found two others that I'd like to pursue. What would be the Amazon protocol in this uh, in this situation? So um, I actually uh, I'm not entirely sure the the entire logistics within Amazon uh, in terms of um, how they would be connecting um, your applications. What I can tell you is what I will see as a hiring manager. So as a hiring manager, if I've got a candidate who applied for multiple roles. I will see that the candidate did apply for multiple roles. Is it a problem to me as a, as a hiring manager? No. Um, if it is a profile that um, I want to attract and get into the interview, if I'm keen to interview you, um, I'll do my best together working with, uh, with the recruiter to get you <clears throat> into my interview. Um, and we would be continuously discussing as, for example, after the interview in terms of how your interactions are going with other teams um, in, in so far as at some point in time, and I've been in situations where I had to actually sell my role to a candidate uh, who uh, another team competed for. So now the exact nitty gritty of how these dots are being connected within the hiring system by the recruiter, I don't know. Maybe Gigi knows she will tell you. But f from the standpoint of should you apply for more roles, of course you should. Just make sure these roles are relevant to your experience. That's all I would say. Uh, Gigi, do you, do you have anything to add? Do you know how this whole logistics works inside? Yeah, yeah. Just one addition, really. So... All of your applications will be pinned together in Hire, as Yevgeny has said, and they're visible to everybody. What will happen is from a recruiter standpoint, if the jobs that you're applying for are close enough and exactly the definition of close enough, I do not know. But if the roles that you're applying are close enough in terms of business units, what they can do sometimes is bring them together in terms of the actual application process. So you would tend to do the first round and the second round if it existed independently, if these two roles were deemed to be close together. And then if you got through both of those to a loop, what they then do is bring the loop together 
And it's called a split loop, which is bizarre because you bring it together. I don't really understand why they call it that, but it seems counterintuitive to me. Uh, a split loop where effectively 50% of the loop are one team and 50% of the loop are the other team. Now, everybody has to agree to that. It's not a default type position. Sometimes hiring managers don't want to do that because they want more people of their team to be able to meet you and they're not confident relying on other teams interviewing technique. Now, it's not very Amazonian. You're supposed to have faith that everybody in Amazon is of an equal standard and capability in terms of their, their interviewing skills. Mm, I can tell you that's not true, but hey ho, that's kind of the philosophy. So that that's kind of the slight nuances. There are times when they will bring it together at the very end of the process, but the roles themselves have to be quite close together in terms of the actual teams and business units in order for them to do that. If you're applying to AWS and Amazon ads for program manager roles, they're never going to bring them together because they're just so far apart in terms of business units. Amazing. Uh, Folks, I'm okay. getting kicked out of my co-work, so I right. literally have to close my laptop and go. Uh, Gigi, we've got a green question there, and we've got something in terms okay. of news to announce. I'll do I it. Trust you'll deliver. I'll do it. Yeah? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. You guys. Good luck. Take care. See you later. Cool. Right. So one more question to answer then. And the reason why we're doing this for Vishal is he's used the um, super chat function, which means you drop a, a few dollars, pennies, rupees, whatever it is. And it uh, kind of jumps up to the top and it makes sure that we look at it. So definitely going to answer this one for you. They haven't read it yet. So I hope I can answer it. So you've applied for an SCE one and you have a bar raise around. So will he ask technical questions or only behavioral? Um, will a software development manager take this round? Okay. So um, if you're applying for a dev role in huge likelihood, your bar raiser is going to be from the development software engineering community. It's such a massive community. It will be very, very easy to find a bar raiser who has kind of the technical skills that you would be interviewing for, but has nothing whatsoever to do with the team that you're working for, which is obviously a prerequisite. So I would put my money on, you are very likely to have a software development kind of person as your bar raiser. It's not an absolute promise. I've bar raised on SDE roles in the past because they couldn't find a bar raiser or someone dropped out last minute and I was a last resort. So it's not a guarantee, but if it's kind of a, if it goes the way the process is supposed to go and nobody drops out last minute or anything, I would suspect that you will get someone from the development community. Will it be a software development manager? Not necessarily. So um, a bar raiser can be an L6. You, you can't be an L5, be a bar raiser, but L6 and above. So you could just as easily have a software development engineer who's an L6 being your bar raiser. Uh, will they ask technical questions, behavioral? Can't answer that. Actually, each team kind of gets to choose the way they want to do it. So um, in some cases, you might have a couple of interviews 100% dedicated to the technical and then the remaining interviews 100% dedicated to the behavioral, or they might choose to split all of the interviews evenly across technical and behavioral. It's entirely up to your hiring manager and their team to determine which way around they want to do it. So my suggestion is to reach out to your recruiter and ask them for the specifics of what you should expect in terms of technical and behavioral and whether they will be dedicated interviews or whether it be split within a single interview to deal with both technical and behavioral. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I wish I could have given you it. It will be exactly like this. But as in most things with the Amazon interview process, there are poss multiple possibilities that you might face. But I wish you the very, very best of luck. All right. So as Yevgeny said, I need to give you two amazing things. OK, so the first is if you go here and there will be when I chat to this thing up, there'll also be a link in the details. Uh, you will get our free taster course for the day one careers course. It's very it's completely dedicated to customer obsession because almost all of you will face customer obsession questions at some point. What it does is it takes you through the four facets of customer obsession. Facets are basically the kind of the different elements, core elements of customer obsession. All leadership principles have multiple facets. Facets, by the way, are not an Amazon term. It's something that we created at Day One Careers. It's a unique way of getting your head around the leadership principles only from us, or if someone else has it, they copied from us. Four facets of um, customer obsession. It'll also tell you what the interviewer is looking for in your answers, what they're looking for. And then finally, there is a mock interview of me interviewing me. So you can see how it all comes together in the final interview. 
please do go get that um, totally free. And it also will give you access to our Discord community where there are over 2,000 other candidates all helping each other out, answering questions, doing mock interviews with each other. It's worth claiming it, even if you never look at the customer obsession information and only make use of the Discord community. Finally, we have an amazing Prime Day promotion happening tomorrow. The 12th and the 13th, we're offering 30% 30% off our flagship Amazon Interview Wiz courses. So the complete course, the premium course, and the mini course. We do not offer discounts very often. We actually only do it twice a year. And this is one. So seriously, if you love this channel, I promise you our paid for content is even better, if you can believe it. So please go check that out. Grab yourself that deal. It will only last for the 12th and the 13th. There'll be no asking us to um, extend the offer after that. So please go check it out. Grab yourself an amazing offer. Thank you so much for joining. For all of you who managed to get your roles, um, wow, amazing. Congratulations. So thrilled for you. If you have an interview coming up, we do wish you the very, very best of luck. And if you haven't given us a thumbs up yet, please do for this and every video that you watch on our channel. Be safe. I am now going to get out of this sweat box because I'm roasting. It's like 40 degrees here. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe. And we will see you soon. Bye bye.